Good evening, everyone. How are you doing? I'm good. All right. Well, let's all stand if you're able, and we'll pray, and we'll get into some of these songs. All right. Lord, I come before you now, and I thank you for this time that we have to gather together. Lord, I pray that it would be fruitful, and that um, these songs wouldn't be just songs that we sing again, that they would be um, a time of worship and a time of meditation. And in your name, Jesus, amen.
God and my King. You are the words that I sing. You are the reason I made this offering. You are my God and my King. You are the words that I sing. You are the reason I made this offering. You are my God and my King. You are the words that I sing.
And Father, we come before you once again tonight. Lord, we have gathered here, Lord, to worship you, Father, to hear your word, Lord, to come and to learn and to grow and to draw closer to you, Lord. So we ask that your spirit would just move freely, Lord, through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening, everybody. You guys may have a seat. Sit down, relax, take a load off. Well, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it, and uh, it's good. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. Uh, just a reminder of our service times, of course. On Sunday morning, we have Sunday morning services at 10 a.m., and also on Sunday evening at 6 p.m., as you all know, and you hear on time. Yay, go, 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 go. Well, I am so glad you guys are here. You, you would not believe how glad I am that you're here. But anyways, we also have a midweek study. Uh, Thursday nights at 7 p.m., and we also have a midweek study in the morning for the men's at 6.30 on Wednesday. Currently, Pastor Mike is going through uh, the book of 1 Corinthians, and we have breakfast for you guys. And as I look at you guys, I think that everything that I'm telling you guys, you guys have it memorized, and you already know what we're going to say. So what would I say next? Go ahead. I'm going to just start pointing at you guys, and you guys tell me what's on the bulletin. But just a reminder, children's ministry. I, you guys didn't expect me to talk about children's ministry this fast. We are looking for some teachers for Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and also Thursday evening. I encourage you to pray, fill out a ministry app, and then join us on Sunday mornings to, to serve our kids. Also, uh, if you desire your tax receipt, please uh, just fill out. Put your name and information on the back, and the following week it'll be prepared for you. And that is something that I encourage you guys to do so that you can get your taxes done. Now, I, I thought about this, you know, in regards to taxes, and, and I thought, well, what about with a shutdown? Are they going to get, well, you know, but what do I know? Just, you, we'll give you everything you need to do your taxes. Whether they send you your check or not, I don't know, but at least you'll do. Remember, you have till April 15th, so I encourage you to get it done in February. Also, uh, here we go, continuing. Save the date. It's going to be on February, Saturday the 16th at 6 p.m. It's going to be a Valentine's dinner, so I encourage you to, you know what? Find a date. If you're not married, find a date. Just come out and join us. But if you're married, make sure you bring your wife or your husband. Don't bring somebody else because we just don't want to have problems here, especially with a saxophonist. You know, he's probably wondering what's going on. Okay, also, Seasons of Sorrow. We have our next meeting on Seasons of Sorrows is going to be, uh, uh, ooh, it's, it's tomorrow, January 21st. It's at 7 p.m. Of course, this is a ministry for those who have lost a loved one. Upcoming also is the uh, sold-out youth. And also, in regards to your tithes and offerings, in addition to if you wish to support Jake and Christina or Josh and Amber, just mark it down. Jay, Christina, Josh, or Amber, or, you know, just whoever you desire to, to help in addition. Well, today, uh, the, the scripture that has been chosen in regards to tithes and offerings is 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5, which I'll read. And just by the way, the reason I'm moving around is because it at later at night, at the dark, I really have a hard time seeing. So when I go down like this, it's because I can't see. Okay, and the verse 5 says, And this they said, they did, not as we had hoped, but first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Now, I looked at that and I thought, well, first of all, by that scripture by itself, it's the word of God. But, but just so that you can grasp a little bit better, I, I really feel it's important that I, I need to read a couple more verses before I share what, what the Lord has laid in my heart. And in verse 2 it says, that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they, they were freely willing. Freely willing to do what? Well, of course, this is in regards to giving towards the ministry, but not just for the ministry there, but it was also going towards the ministry for the church in, in Jerusalem. But here's the important thing, and I'll read verse uh, 5 one more time. It says, and, they, and this they did, not that we had hope, but first gave of themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Well, here's the thing. 
the first thing I see is they gave of themselves. But here, they did it in such a, man, in such a manner that was tangible. And see, here's the picture that I see that's so important. You know, when you give something, not, let's not think materialistic. Let's think action. Let's think love, kindness, the gratitude that you have because of what God has done for you, that you do something for somebody else. Sure, it is talking about financially, but what I'm talking about, I'm talking about is the desire to serve God in such a way that other people can see, that it's tangible, not to receive praise this from them or from anybody else, but that in such a way that it leaves a mark with other people. And see, that's the first thing I see. I see that they, that they first they did, they did something. They did it in such a way that it was tangible, that they gave them themselves to the Lord. And that was the thing. They gave themselves to the Lord, but he also goes on to say, but they gave themselves to us. So whatever they did, in regards to their giving, in regards to the midst of their poverty, in regards to the time that they did not actually have to give, but they gave. They gave, but they did it by the will of God. And see, that's the last thing I want to leave with you. It is the will of God that we not just give our finances, which, you know, I, I always minimize the finances, and I always encourage that it's the condition of the heart. I always encourage the action, the love, the grace that you have towards others. But it is the financial, and that's why they put it in this portion, because we're not going to take an offering tonight, but what we are going to do is give you an opportunity to worship the Lord, first and foremost, in worship, in song, in the word, but also if you desire to give in tithes and offerings, we have a little box, and you could drop it off on the, on the way out. Thank you, guys, and God bless you. Uh-huh.
Amen. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, it says that our sins were crucified on the cross with Jesus. And isn't that awesome? And then it goes on further to say that, that the Holy Spirit empowers us and, and guides us. And um, that's what this song is all about. It's all about the Holy Spirit. So let's not just sing this song. Let's, let's pray this song together.
Let's all stand together for this last song. truly serve an awesome God and Father we just lift up tonight to you we lift up your word and just going through this chapter 6 of Daniel Lord that it would just speak to our hearts talking to us about faithfulness the faithfulness of Daniel and Lord our own faithfulness so Father I just pray we would have an ear to hear the things that you have to tell us Father that you would continue to just bless pastor and his wife as they've been on vacation as things are winding down, that he just be ready to go and, and serve you as he always does. And I just ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you guys go ahead and greet one another, and, and we'll get started in a minute. Hey, guys. Nice. Well, hopefully I don't go popping in this mic too much. I came up here and I forgot. I wanted the, the wireless headset, but that's all right. We're good. We'll survive. Um, well, as you know, Pastor Mike's still on vacation and uh, just finishing up. He'll be uh, starting with, I think he'll be doing golf with the guys tomorrow morning and then uh, jumping in. He'll be doing Thursday night study and, of course, uh, Sunday on. So keep him in prayer and then... Uh, We'll just get on the study. Tonight we're in uh, chapter 6 of Daniel, and oh, I couldn't think of a good 
good name. I had all these little clever names and everything. You know what? It's just about faithfulness and how faithful Daniel is because we've been going through these chapters. We're here in, in really what I say is the last chapter of really Daniel's journey. Uh, obviously, we have a bunch more chapters, but they're really a revelation that the Lord has given to him to show him to tell us what's going to happen in the future, when our Lord was going to come, and all these different things. Um, but right now, we've just been watching and looking at his life and the life of his buddies and Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, and and watching how the Lord has just worked through them. So one more time, we get to keep going through that. And so we'll read uh, Daniel 6. We'll look at the first five verses, and then, of course, we'll read on from there. But it says here in verse 1 of chapter 6, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, to be over the whole kingdom. And over these, three governors of whom Daniel was one, and the satraps might give an account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the, above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, that they could find, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So it's just fascinating when we look at that. And so Daniel by now, if, if you recall the last couple of verses of, of chapter 5, he ended up becoming third in, uh, in line as far as the king. We had the king who's been away, but Belshazzar was the acting king, and now Daniel is third. And he was clothed with a robe and everything, and he says, no, 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 I don't need any of that stuff, but they did it anyway, and off you go. And next thing you know, that night, Belshazzar, Belshazzar was slain, and uh, just a very prideful man, so prideful, just against everything related to God and anything godly. And so the Lord took him. And then uh, Darius, so Darius takes over Babylon that night, and, um, and Daniel ends up coming along. We're sitting here in verse 1 of chapter 6. What's the deal? We look at it, and, and Daniel's right there again. Uh, but uh, for, I wanted to look at First Peter chapter two uh, really quick to start with, and actually, honestly, I can't remember why I picked that verse or those verses. <laughs> uh, but it says here, First uh, Peter two thirteen through seventeen. It says, "Therefore, submit yourselves." Oh, this is why. <laughs> Here's Daniel. Daniel, loving the Lord and loving the Lord first before and above anything and everything it doesn't matter what same thing with Shadrach Meshach and Abednego and it says here in verse 13 this is for us just as much as for him obviously it says therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake whether to the king supreme or to the governors or those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers for the praise of those who do good for this is the will of God that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men this is what Daniel, this is what Daniel's all about, doing good, serving the Lord Jesus Christ constantly, constantly putting to silence the ignorance of the foolish men that were around him. And so they kind of had it, this whole other crew here, they've had it as well. But verse 16, it says, as free, yet not using liberality as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants of God, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God honor the king because the Lord puts him there so this is Daniel's mindset it's kind of like I almost see Paul or Peter writing this um, thinking of Daniel and what he did in all 70 years and the things that he did and everything that we saw is what would cause Peter to pen this it was just kind of an interesting thing that's why I had picked those verses but anyway in verse 1 it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom and so the way it worked is um, you had these satraps, and under each one of them it says, and over these three governors whom Daniel was one. And it's interesting. So you've got 120 satraps, and then you have three governors. And it says here that Daniel was one here in the New King James. In the King James, it says he was first, and that's it. He was, he was top of the three. He was recognized as, as almost the leader of the three, but not 
quite, but he was first. He was well noted. They knew him, and they knew of him, the, the Darius Wood. And so when you look at that, so each of these governors had 40 satraps under them. Daniel was first, and then it was the other guys. And then so we look at that. Um, so again, over these three governors of whom Daniel was one or first, that the satraps might give an account to them so that the king would suffer, uh, suffer no loss. So we've got here to give an account. It's judgment, judgment or discretion or report. So I would think Daniel probably a little bit more helpful, a little, not just reporting, but relating, but even, even forecasting. And, and it's kind of like, you know, I work with my brother and he's our, our principal of our office and, and managing principal and I handle all the finances and all that. And um, it's interesting, well, what is it that he likes as, as the leader, as the principal of my office? Well, you know, how, how is this agency, you know, we have all these different agencies that, that, are, that are part of us, but how are they doing? What's going on? What direction are they going? Is, well, how, are they on budget? Are they doing the profit they need to do? And uh, it's like, well, yeah, profit's a little bit high over here, which is good. This is why there was an extra bonus, you know, whatever the issue is. And then I can tell them how it's going to end out at the end of the year. This is what's going to happen. Well, it's a little low. This is the reason, but I believe it'll come up because this is what's going to happen. And I just kind of forecast, here's where we're going to be at the end of the year. So I can see Daniel looking at his region, going out, not just saying, yep, everything's great. Here's what you have. Here's the taxes and here's how it worked out. Oh, there was a little skirmish here, and this is what I did to help it. This is what I encourage we should do in the future. This, this will help here and there. So he's giving the report, and, and that's what would probably set him apart, if you will. So called to give a reasonable, detailed response, a clear decisions, direction, and not having a bunch of errors. And so you can see Daniel is promoted and promoted and promoted. He constantly gets promotions. And look at um, Proverbs 29-23. And we can see 29-23. Uh, A man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. So you've got a humble man. He's retaining that honor. In fact, he's more honorable than the other three, so much so we'll see a result of that. But everybody else, we're looking to be pretty prideful. And we can see in James, James 4.10 tells us, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. We need to work as unto the Lord. But we humble ourselves in his sight, and he will lift you up. He will lift me up. So kind of looking back really quick, just a couple of things. Daniel chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, we can look at some things that happen here as far as uh, a promotion or, or what happened with Daniel. It says, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, this would be Daniel and the rest of the youth, the, the Jewish youth, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego that were with him, found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all of his realm. And then verse 21, thus Daniel continued until the first day of, of King Cyrus. And so we're right now in that, into King Cyrus's time. Daniel chapter 2, verse 48, looking at this verse, it says, then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, the chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. And this, uh, when he interpreted the dream, not only did he interpret the dream, but the Lord told him what the dream was in the first place. And this just right after the king was fed up was going to kill all the wise men, including Daniel and Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Chapter 3, verse 30, another little glimpse into Daniel, what happened. Um, it says here, then the king promoted, oh, this is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in the province of Babylon. Why? They served their Lord. They were promoted. They were wise enough to stick to what the Lord has shown them to do. And they survived that fiery furnace, and the king immediately recognized and saw that the Lord was with them and promoted them. That's who he wants to lead. His kingdom is God-fearing, honest men and women with integrity who stand up for what they believe. And then, of course, Daniel chapter 5, verse 29, what we looked at uh, last week. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be third ruler 
in the kingdom. Promotion after promotion after promotion. Very simple, James 4.10, something that we need to know. I just said it, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. And then looking at the, the verses that we were just in, he said in the end of verse 2, it says, so that the king would suffer no loss. And really, that's no damage. Uh, there can be political damage, if you will, or physical damage, or people being unhappy, and, and the productivity of your kingdom starts dropping. They don't want to serve the king. They don't want, they're no interest in, there's no um, nationality or, or whatever it is. So Daniel's charge is to run his region well. So he's an excellent advocate by, by uh, example, honor, commitment, his duty, his faithfulness. So you imagine these, these subjects that are really under Daniel and under his area of the rule. Why? What, what, what did it say here in verse 3? It says, then this Daniel distinguished himself above the other governors and the satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. What kind of spirit is in you? What kind of spirit is in me when I go to my office? I got a, I got a hundred people on my floor now starting Monday. Three of our offices have, have merged in together on the fifth floor of this building. And, and it's all the more reason why I really need to have the Holy Spirit with me and in me, dealing with all these people and the things that I have to do with the finances and, and the support that I do for our region and, and what's going on. So what kind of spirit is in you? Is there an excellent spirit in you? How do you get that excellent spirit? It's being close to the Lord Jesus Christ. How are we close to him? Again, it's reading reading his word, understanding the things that he has to tell us and, and through his word. And so Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, you do wholeheartedly as unto the Lord and not as unto man. When I had my own agency, that was a tagline on my checks. Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, you do wholeheartedly as unto the Lord, not to man. Yes, I cater to men. Yes, I have to sell to men. Yes, I all these things. But when I do this work, when I work for my brother or whoever it is, I need to work as unto the Lord, not unto man. Because we can get away with stuff when we work with man. Look at all these other 120 or these other two uh, governors that were over 80 of these satraps. They were just getting by. They, were, they could get by with it, but not next to Daniel because an excellent spirit was within him. And so you look at this Daniel, and he's in retirement for a while, all of a sudden, boom, Cyrus brings him right back. He didn't get killed with Belshazzar. That's interesting. Belshazzar was second ruler. Daniel was third. Why didn't he get killed? The Lord protected him. The Lord protected Somebody knew who he was. Somebody was able to share with Cyrus, and Cyrus was able to believe, well, maybe I should watch this guy Daniel. And sure enough, next thing you know, Daniel, he'd just assume have Daniel right behind him, second ruler, if you will under Cyrus. And so we need to, uh, sometimes, you know, you look at Daniel, he's sitting there, he's in retirement. How, who, who knows how long he was in retirement? Uh, when the queen mother came out to Sonny Belshazzar and lectured him on who this Daniel guy was and all the things that he did for, for probably her, would be, I guess, her father-in-law, um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. So Daniel was probably retired for a while. But you know what? We need to remember if we're on a shelf for a while or we're just aside or sitting there, what do we need to do? We need to just take that time and realize that we're called to be meditating on the Lord, sitting and waiting on him and his time and the things that he wants us to do just to be ready. Bam. Daniel was ready. Next thing you know, here he is. So in verse 3 again, why? That Daniel distinguished himself because there was an excellent spirit was in him and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So here's these two governors that are next to him. It's Daniel first and then the other two and they're over all the satraps. But Cyrus is like, you know, I got my eye on this guy. This, I think I'm going to make him ruler over everything. And then we'll have a really smooth running kingdom. So turn with me to Proverbs 14.30. And Proverbs 14.30, it's really, uh, it's pride. Um, I can't remember what the verse was. Proverbs 14.30 says this. It says, um, Proverbs, a sound heart is a life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. Oh, yes, it's envy. That's right. We've got these guys. What, the only reason, the only reason they'd be upset is envy, jealousy, 
whatever it is. It's rottenness to the bones. It's very clear in that. Think about Cain, Cain and Abel, Genesis uh, probably 4. Genesis 4, what happened with Cain? The Lord said to him, why is your countenance fallen? Why is your countenance fallen? This is when he's, he was envious or jealous of his brother Abel, whose sacrifice was accepted, and Cain's wasn't. Cain did what he wanted to do. Abel did what the Lord prescribed. It was the fat of the lambs that he was to, to give. Cain just gave the fruit of his, his work, the ground, the vegetables, whatever it was. Might have been the best. They might have been better vegetables you could possibly imagine. But that's not what the Lord asked for. That's not what the Lord required. So Cain, envious, says, why is your countenance fallen? In Numbers chapter 16, maybe we can go to Numbers 16, verse 3. We can look at a couple another another uh, issue and I think it's actually it was Korah and um, I just want to read verse 16.3 of Numbers it says here they gather together so this is Moses Moses up he's he's uh, Aaron's the high priest Moses is the leader he's the one that's going to have the Ten Commandments and bring them down he's the one that communes with God all together and Moses is in charge this is the deal and so now we've got Korah and and some others coming up to Moses in verse 3, it says, They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, So, two brothers, two brothers, you know, you guys are in cahoots with one another. There's no reason why you should get all the limelight, be in charge, and, and talk to God. We want to as well. And so, you take too much upon yourselves, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above this assembly of the Lord? Why do you think you're in charge so when Moses heard it in verse 4 he fell on his face he interceded right there on their behalf before the Lord remember he was the most humble man there was and he spoke and then he spoke to Korah and all his company saying tomorrow morning the Lord will show you who is holy and so we go through all of that and we can see the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible commentary turn to Psalm Psalm 106 Psalms 106, and we can see why, what happened to Korah and his rebellion. Psalm 106, verses 16 to 18. It's all pride. It's envy. It's all the same thing. It's, it's wanting that which is not yours, which is not mine. Psalm 106, verses 16 to 18, it says, When they envied Moses in the camp, and Aaron, the saint of the, of the Lord, the earth opened up and swallowed up Dathan and covered the faction of Abiram. A fire was kindled in their company and a flame burned up the wicked. It wasn't just the men. It wasn't just the men. It was the wives and the children and everything they had as well. The earth opened up, swallowed them up, and then the burned everything up and then it closed back up over them. That's envy. That's envy. We're not to envy. We need to give it over to the Lord. And so you've got these guys who are envying Daniel. What did he have? He had an excellent spirit in him. It was the Holy Spirit. It's by the Holy Spirit that he's able to do these things. Esther uh, and uh, Haman, we'll look at that again. But Haman the Agagite, he wanted to kill the Jews. He hated Mordecai. Mordecai sat at the king's gate. And, and he served the king, and he didn't know something that happened earlier that he actually saved the king's life. He found somebody that was, that was going to poison the king, and they were able to get rid of him. And Mordecai, he, or uh, uh, Haman hated Mordecai, and Mordecai wouldn't bow down to him. And he said, you know what, I'm just going to kill all the Jews. Unbeknownst to him, Queen Esther, the king's uh, wife, was Jewish. And so we'll, we'll see a little bit on that story. But it's only by God's grace that they were protected. And I think about the diligence, the work that Daniel did all 70 years. We watch it and we see it. We see in the very first chapter, thus Daniel did all the way into the first year of, of Cyrus, King Cyrus. And I look at the diligence. I, I even look at it. I say, you know what? I love my kids. They're, they're up here worshiping. Praise God. You know, I got good kids. And, you know, sometimes I remember a person came to me God, it was a couple of years ago, you're so lucky to have such good kids. Wow. I'm like, you know what? It's, there's no luck. Yes, it's the grace of God, but it's hard work. You guys know you have kids. Those of you that have kids, it's not easy raising kids. It's not easy passing that baton of faith to the kids or keep trying. You keep doing it. You keep doing it. 
You know, I know what my wife has given up and done. We homeschool them. We keep our thumbs on them. I mean, I, I think it's in a healthy way. But nonetheless, it's, it's work. It's diligence. And you look at that, it's a commitment, and it's only by the grace of God and the Holy Spirit that enables us to do these things. And then look at that. It's amazing when you see Daniel, just flipping back to Daniel, and we can just go back a couple chapters. I want to look a couple verses, chapters, uh, chapter 2, verses 27 and 28. Why? Why is Daniel so blessed? What is it that he do, does? Verse 27, when Daniel answered in the presence of the king, and he said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the, sooth, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. This is the king. He just said, I'm going to kill everybody because you can't even tell me my dream and you, let alone interpret it. And Daniel goes up before he tells him, he says, you know what? We don't know. We can't help you. Nobody can tell you. Not nobody. And then follows it up with verse 28. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the future. And he goes on and tells him and interprets the dream. He always gives God the credit. He always gives God the credit. We have to give him the credit. In Matthew chapter 6, we look at uh, Matthew 6, 30. This is, this is really what we're called to do. This is what we need to do and to remember. Matthew 6, 30 through 34. <laughs> if I can find Matthew, there it is. 6.30, it says this. Uh, now, if God, excuse me, now if God so clothes the grass in the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Verse 31, therefore, don't, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all of these things the Gentiles seek, and that, that would be unbelievers, for your heavenly Father knows, knows that you need all of these things. Does, doesn't God know your needs? Doesn't God know you need to eat? Doesn't God know you need a place to live or sleep? Doesn't God know you, you need clothes? I think he does. It says here in verse 33, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry of its, about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Did Daniel worry about the tomorrow? <laughs> you can see clearly he had enough to deal with in the day that was there, and that's what his focus was. And so we can look at um, looking at him through the lions. Did he care about that day? No, nope. he was going to do what he did every day, and he knelt down and he prayed. That's what he did. He would pray. And so we'll see that coming up. But um, we have the same opportunity today, especially the older we get. We get to look back and see our history, our serving the Lord and the things that have happened. Whether you're an older believer or not, it doesn't matter. You can look back a year, six months, two years, five years, ten years, whatever it is, and see where God interceded, see where the Lord had blessed you in these different things, just like we've been looking at, at uh, uh, Daniel. And so... So you need to stay focused on the Lord and the things that he has. We can do no more and no less. Today has enough worry of its own. Just focus on these things. So verses 4 and 5, it says, So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any charge against Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So I can kind of imagine them. He's not even one of us. Ew, he's one of those Jews with those long beards and the curls and, and they, you know, I'm like, whatever it is. I mean, and, he, and he's telling, he's leading us. He's like more important than us. You know what? We got to get rid of him. And so they sat there and looked at him. And the first thing it says, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful. They looked directly at Daniel and couldn't find no charge. A charge would be an occasion, a matter, or an affair, something that would raise, raise flags. And the second thing, a fault, a fault would be corruption. Did you do anything in personal gain? Was there corruption? They're actually just looking at his personal character. There's no charge against him, and there's no fault. And the second set, because why? Because he was faithful. Are you faithful? Am I faithful? Are we faithful to the Lord to let him lead, guide and direct us and point us in the right direction. Nor was there any error 
or fault found in him. An error would be neglect or remission. It's not paying attention to the detail, being lazy, skating by. That would cause your errors. A fault, basically corruption. Uh, a way to personally benefit. Did he do anything to personally benefit in anything that he did? They could find nothing. They could find nothing. It's just like the only way they can find something is to change the rules. It's just like today, I mean, what do we have? We have pro-choice. It's not abortion. It's pro-choice. Soften the words. Change the words. Oh, you're anti-choice? You won't let people choose? And making good for evil and evil for good. I mean, these are the things that people do. Jesus healing on the Sabbath. And, in fact, let's turn there. Um, um, well, I thought it was. Mark, um, it's not in here, or maybe I'm jumping ahead of myself, but Mark 6, or maybe it's Mark 3. Let me look. I'm sorry. Mark uh, 6, 1 or th Mark 3, 1 through 6. Yes, Jesus. And he entered in the synagogue again, and he said there a man was there. He had a withered hand. So they watched him closely, whether Jesus would heal him on the Sabbath, that they might accuse him. So, oh, he's going to do work on the Sabbath. And so Jesus said to the man with the withered hand, he said, step forward. And then he said to everybody else, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? to save life or to kill. What really is it lawful to do? But they kept silent, and when he had looked around them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out immediately, plotted with the Herodians to plot against him on how they might destroy him. So Second Peter chapter 1. Go to 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. It says, this is to us, this is to us Christians. It says, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness. In verse 7, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. And verse 8 says, For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Does it say you'll be barren or unfruitful in money and things and whatever? No, it's in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's through him and his wisdom that we have that we're successful, that we're able to lead a life with him. And so um, looking back here again at Daniel, so uh, we're not, first of all, we're looking at this. He's talking to a bunch of believers, right? But what are the rest of the verses? What are the verses that he's really telling us? So we see these first ones, and let's look at verses 9 through 11. It says, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted. So why would he be, why would Peter be telling people these things? because perhaps they're not doing them all. For, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. We need to do these things and remember, God forgave us of these sins. And then verse 11, so... For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What's the purpose of everything we do? It's to be with him, enter into his kingdom with him so that it's our kingdom, we're with him. So be sure that it's about our faithfulness to our Lord and then we'll do these things. First, uh, Second Thessalonians, why? Well, it, Second Thessalonians 3.3 3 tells us, but the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. He's the one that's faithful and is going to guard us. But we have our part too. We need to focus on him, as does Daniel. In fact, Job chapter 27, I think I, I didn't get these verses uh, in, but Job 27, I was going through this, I mean, it's really the whole chapter, but we'll just look at a couple of the verses, 27, 13, and 15. It says here, um, this is the portion of a wicked man with God and the heritage of oppressors received from the Almighty. If his children are multiplied, 
it is for the sword. Think about uh, when they came up against Moses. They were envious. They were wicked. They were seeking only themselves. What about these guys we're going to look at? It's the same thing. And then verse chapter 28, 28 in Job says, And to man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Fearing the Lord is wisdom. Fearing the Lord means we listen to him. We read about him. We trust in him. We live by him. And so looking again back in, in, in Daniel, chapter, uh, uh, or chapter 6, verse 6, it says, So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. Uh, so they're, they're just inundating him with him with, with respect, with honor and flattery and all of these things. And, and they're kind of coming up onto him with these salutations and all that. In verse 7, it said, All the governors of the kingdom and the administrators and satraps and counselors and advisors have consulted together. So was it all or most? All but Daniel? They're, they're giving them the impression that, hey, it's unanimous. We all got together, and this is what we think we should do. We want to establish a royal statute to make firm decree that whoever, whoever petitions any god, excuse me, or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. And so they give the appearance. Obviously, it's a unanimous decision. And then verse 8, now, O king, establish a decree and sign in writing that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. It is signed, sealed, and delivered. Boom, done deal. Once it's signed, that's it in the law. You can't revoke it. It's, it's done. In fact, we can kind of remember, and I even talked about um, uh, Haman in, in the book of Esther. It's, we won't go there, but 60 years later, we can look at Esther, and we can look at what happened, and finally Haman gets gets the king and says, you know, there's a group of people, they take all of our money and they have all of our wealth and we need to get rid of them. They're, they're captives and they're left over and, and we need to get rid of them because they're not good for the kingdom. And so this decree goes in on the 13th of Adar, you're going to, everybody has a right to destroy and take from all the Jews. Boom, it's signed in as law. And Mordecai, Esther's uncle, Queen Esther, she's, finally she gets enough Curtis, okay, fast for me. I'm going I'm to go talk to the king and sets everything up. And finally, they realize that, that Haman is just an evil man, but they can't undo the law. It's set. The Persians of the Medes, the law, once it's written, it's set. So what do they do? They write another law. Only Mordecai and, and Esther write the law. Let all the Jews be able to come up against those who come against the Jews and fight for their lives and their families. And so that's what happened. And in the 14th, they did it again, and, and they killed thousands and thousands of people because they were coming up against the Jews. And the king, it pleased the king because his wife was Jewish, and he loved her, and they served the goal. In fact, when they went in on the 14th and they killed all their enemies that were in, in the citadel and all that, they didn't touch anything, any of their money, any of their things or everything. They just left it, which showed... They were just doing what they needed to protect themselves. So, in fact, so we can go through, again, back to uh, verse, verse 9. It says, therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. So they signed the decree. And then verse 10. So what did Daniel? Daniel, did he alter his life? Did he change anything? Absolutely not. Now, Daniel knew that the writing was signed, and he went home in his upper room, and his windows open toward Jerusalem and he knelt down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before the God as was his custom since the early days. In other words, as he'd done for 70 years, as he had done for 70 years, did he change? Absolutely not. Well, it's just kind of funny that they happened to be there, happened to see him pray at those specific times. I'm sure they set them the they set themselves up just to be there. But verse 11, then these men assembled found Daniel praying and making supplication before, supplication before God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast in the lion, into the den of lions? And the king answered and said, yeah, the thing is true according to the law of the Medes and the Persians which does not alter. Oh, yeah, you guys are right. You were here. I signed it. That's right. You can't alter it. So what do they say in verse 13? In verse 13, we read, 
So they answered and said before the king that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. The shoe falls. Oh, so now here he is. He's wanting to put him in charge of everything, and all of a sudden he just broke this law. He can't do anything about it. In fact, um, it's kind of funny. You look at Daniel, and he goes up there, and he serves God, and he loves the Lord. He prays. He gets direction from God. He hears from him, and he does things accordingly. What happens even, even when we get a, a strong Catholic in office? What do they ask him when he's up there? Are you going to let your religion dictate what you do? Are you going to let it influence your opinion and the, and the votes that you make? Oh, God, I hope so. I hope somebody with integrity that falls after God does that and makes a decision for things that should be right. But that's what happens. And now this is, so it's kind of almost the same thing if you look at it. So verse 14, this is, this is, wow. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself. Why was he displeased? Oh, in his pride, he was willing to accept all his worship and everything else. He's like, what have I done? And he set his heart to Daniel to deliver him, and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. What can I do? How can I save Daniel? What can I do? Where can I go? Um, what is it? Pri uh, Proverbs 18, it says 18, but I think it's 18, 16. It says, pride before destruction, destruction and haughtiness before the fall. The pride, the, oh, it's horrible. You, it, 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 pride kills. Pride kills. Plain and simple, pride kills. Because of our pride, um, things never go right. In fact, we look at James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Um, James 4, 1 through 6. It says, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from, from your desires for pleasure that war within your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet. You cannot obtain. By the way, who's he writing to? Who's James writing to? He's writing to Christians. He's writing to us, to you and I. We're here looking at, at, at a king that's really a, an unbeliever, but he knows this guy serves God and he's a good guy. But this, this James is writing to us. He says, you fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. And then you ask and you don't receive. Why? Because you ask amiss. You don't even ask for the right things. You don't even seek the Lord. And that you may spend it on your pleasures. And then verse 4, adulterers and adulteresses. What is that? That's an adulteress uh, or adulterer is, is, is uh, uh, communing with someone else other than God. It's letting something else take the place of God. That's adultery to our Lord. And so he says here, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? So we're, we're, we're being an adulterer with the world instead of God. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Just, that's to us as a believer. This is what James is writing. So we need to remember these. We need to keep, again, our focus on the Lord. And Proverbs 3.34 um, also tells us, Proverbs 3.34, it says, Surely he scorns the scornful but gives grace to the humble. Again, it's humility, remembering to be humble before the Lord, seek him, and we won't have that adulterous thing that we do. We won't put the Lord, the world before the Lord. In fact, Acts 4.12, uh, it says, nor is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven by which among men must be saved. It's the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone only. And so you look at this king, back to Daniel. We look at this King Cyrus. He wants to save Daniel against the law. There is only one law and there is only one Savior. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And the law, we cannot keep. Only he can keep. That's why Jesus is our Savior. And so here we've got a picture of the world trying to do something, trying to save someone, all of these things. But it's for naught. It's for naught. Because only Christ saves. So verses 15 and 17. How does, how does Darius deliver him? Well, what happens here? Does he? Verse uh, 15 to 17, it says, Then... Then these men approached the king and said, O king, or no, O king, that this is the law of the Medes and the Persians, that no decree or statue which the king establishes may be changed. They're reminding him. Can't change this king. I know you're trying to save him, but 
You wrote the law, this is it, he's toast. So the king, I'm sorry, he's cat food. So the king came, gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of the lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Wow. He's using Daniel's words for him. He's using Daniel, Daniel's words for him. There's nothing else he can do. In verse 17, Then a stone was brought, laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring, with the signets of his lords, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. That's it. All done, right? Nah. That's, that's not it. So in verse 18, we just kind of come up here. What, what did the king do? He says, now the king went to his palace and he spent the night fasting. What else can I do? Can I do anything else for Daniel? What, what, what can I do? Wanting to do these things. So fasting, no musicians were brought before him. Also, his sleep went from him. Couldn't sleep. It's horrible. Again, what does pride do? It kills. But for Daniel. Then the king arose early in the morning and he went with haste to the den of the lions. So um, Cyrus knew Daniel's God could save him. Heard enough of Daniel that his God could save him. Just Cyrus needs to have it. His God. And so verse 20, it's cool. It says, and when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. So I'm, I really, I look at this and I really think that Cyrus thinks that God could have saved him. He really believes that God, why else would he even go? Otherwise he wouldn't even go to bother. I mean, who wants to look at a bunch of bones of your buddy down in the pit? I mean, seriously, if you look at that. So the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? O oh, king, live forever. Yes! Oh my gosh, I can imagine the excitement he would. My God, and the Daniel's excited. My God sent his angel, and he shut the lion's mouths, and he goes through, so, so that they have not hurt me, because... I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I've done no wrong before you. Fascinating. Who's he innocent before? It's before an almighty God. Turn to Genesis chapter 39. Genesis 39. I want to look at just a quick thing. And, and um, uh, Genesis 39. Who are we innocent before? Who do we sin against, really? 39 we can look, I want to start, it says verses 7 to 9, but I want to start at verse 4, Genesis 39, 4. So Joseph found favor in his sight. Now this is Potiphar who bought Joseph as a slave, brought him home, and, and Joseph served him. Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. Everything that Potter had, he gave to Joseph. Joseph, t take care of it. He's watching what's happening and how how. Everything is multiplying and running well and smooth. In fact, later on, you can read that Joseph tells uh, 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 the master's wife, my master doesn't even know what he has. He doesn't even know what he has. And he says this. He says, so verse 5, so it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house, all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and all that he had in the field. Verse 6. Thus, he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not even know what he had except for the bread that which he ate. That's how much Potiphar trusted Joseph and how an excellent of a spirit was within him. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Uh-oh. And it came to pass in verse 7 after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But... He refused and said his, to his master's wife, Look, my master doesn't know what he has with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in the house than I, and this is what Joseph is saying, nor has he held back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin, sin against God? wasn't sinning against Potiphar, wasn't sinning against anybody, but God, God himself. So back in Daniel, Daniel knows. What was his reaction again, or what did he say? He said, I have not sinned against my God, nor have I done anything wrong against you. He's telling him, he's telling him who he serves. And so 
uh, in verse verse uh, 22. So my God, oh, verse 23 says, Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded him that they should take Daniel out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den. No injury whatsoever was found on him because he believed in his God. God protect him. God kept him. He um, was there. He had that hedge around him, if you will. And so, which brings me to the next point. It was kind of interesting. I was... Um, we were on our way to Oceanside on Saturday, uh, or was it Ocean? Yeah, Oceanside or Escondido. That's right. They had a basketball game. A couple of the kids had a game out there, one of them. And so we're driving out there, and I'm like, okay, guys, you know what? No phones, no tablets, nothing. You have to read your day's reading first, and then you can do whatever. And also, I want to talk to you about it. And so uh, most of them are on the chronological Bible this year with, with my wife. I cannot do the chronological one year by. It just it confuses me. I, I can't. I can't. For 25, 28 years, I've been reading the one-year Bible. I've always gone to the, one, to the New Testament and the Old Testament the same way. I, I know where the books are. I know, I know how, kind of how they relate. And I, chronological just confuses, confuses me to no end. So one of the kids was reading, actually, they were reading Joseph, uh, about Joseph and Genesis and some of the other things. But anyway, it was interesting. We were talking about, and we read, I said, so the reading happened to be a Job, first four chapters of Job, and I said, well, what's going on? Well, Satan went after Job. I said, well, okay, pretty much. In fact, uh, what it was, and, and Satan, uh, or in 1 Peter 5, 8, we even heard from Richard this morning, says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I said, well, okay, well, let's look at that again really quick. Let's relook at the chapter. I said, what really happened? Ah, God called Satan and said, what are you doing? Well, I'm roaming around, seeking who he can devour. And God asked Satan, well, have you considered my servant Job? Have you considered my servant Job? He said, well, no, you have a hedge around him. Everything's protected. He said, okay, said, you, can, you can have everything, but you can't touch his life. I've got a hedge right around him. And so I was talking to the kids. I said, well, think about that. When the Lord you know, calls us to do something and, and we're working or we're doing whatever we're, and we're in his will, we're immortal. We are immortal until he calls us home. Plain and simple. And Pastor Mike's always saying that, right? We're immortal until God calls us. We can do anything. Go anywhere. Do anything because God's called us there and he's there protecting us. And so I thought it was fascinating. And then I thought, I have this old, uh, old uh, book called Handwriting on the Wall by David Jeremiah. And I bought it actually in December of 1992, I think it was, or they, maybe it was 91. But I bought this as commentary on Daniel. I said, oh, that's kind of cool. And so I put everything together and I'm like, oh, oh man, I forgot to check out what this says about chapter six. And so what was fascinating, I'm reading, let's see, it's page 127, I think. I'm reading it, going through it. I'm like, oh, wow, this was trippy. Because you think about it, this is 26 years ago I bought this, right? And I've read through it once, one, another time before. But I'm going here, and I'm looking at David Jeremiah. Writes, he says, you know, when I, first, when I first began to travel, I would get on an airplane, and I'd go somewhere, and I'd have a battle in my soul. I was afraid something would happen to me, and I'd never see my family again. What would happen to them while I was gone? In those early days when I went out to speak, I would be tortured in my mind. I would get there, call my wife to see if everything is all right. Then I would go off and preach about trusting God and having faith. <laughs> and, so, and then he said, one day I read something that impressed me so profoundly that I haven't worried since. And it said, a man of God in the will of God is immortal until the work on, on, earth, on, the, till the work on earth is done. What that meant to me was that as long as I'm a man of God doing the will of God, nothing can touch me until God is done with me. And when he's done with me, I don't want to hang around anymore. But what's fascinating is I looked at this, and I'm reading through this. It's underlined. It's the younger me 26 years ago when I'm 25 years old telling me at 51, remember, Sean, you're immortal. Not that I'm immortal physically, but I'm just like, Wow, I mean, it's all underlined from 26 years ago. But it's just fascinating that this, oh yeah, Pastor Mike says this. I'm like, oh my gosh, I learned this even longer ago. But the fact is, be faithful. He's got a hedge around you. He's going to protect you, and he's going to do these things through you to glorify him, to bring glory to him. And so, again, verse 24 in Daniel chapter 6, I said, look, and the king gave the command that they brought those men who had accused Daniel. 
and they cast them into the den of the lions. Wow, he wasn't happy. Well, them, their children, and their wives. Now remember this, you know what? A, a, a son is not going to pay for his father's sins. The, God, the Lord said he's not going to punish the sons for the sins of the fathers. Well, unless the sons are continuing in the sins of the fathers, well, they're going to get punished for their own sins. But this is the world, and this is what's going on here. But the fact of the matter is, what did I say earlier? Pride, pride kills. Pride kills. It takes away, it kills spiritually. Psalm, um, uh, what is it? Uh, Psalm 7, 14 through 16, I just wrote this down. It says, Behold, the wicked brings forth iniquity. Yes, he conceives trouble and brings forth falsehood. He made a pit, and he dug it out, and he has fallen into the ditch which he made. His trouble shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealing shall come down on his own crown. This is what people do when they plot and do these things, and it's the pride that drives them. We've got to focus on the Lord. And so either the wives or the sons or the daughters were every bit as wicked, and they did those things as well, or encouraging them, the older stuff, whatever it is, they're participating. But whatever it is, the husbands were the leader. The fathers are the leaders of their household. What are we doing as fathers to our families? Are we focusing on the Lord Jesus Christ and letting him do the work through us as, as Daniel did? We can look at Achan, Achan's sin, and Joshua, and he comes in, and he, they're told to everything they conquer when they go in and, and conquer AI, they're, they're to... Uh, dedicated everything over to the Lord, goes to the Lord. But what did Achan do? He found some gold and some garments. He dug a hole in his tent and he buried it. The Israelites went out to fight a battle again and 36 people died because of Achan's sin. And they whittled it down and found, found who it was. He says, well, I saw the beauty of this and I wanted to keep it and I kept it and I buried it in my tent. What happened? They took him, his wife, and his kids and, and they were stoned to death in a big pile of rocks. But what was it? They, he was leading his family. They're all there. They're all participating. They probably helped him carry the gold and the garments and buried it in the tent with him. What are the things that we're doing as family heads of our households, as leaders, whoever you are, whatever you're doing? We need to remember these things. Focus on the Lord. But verse 25 to 27 says this. He says, I'm, um, The king Darius wrote to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that every do, in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. Who oh, does he recognize who God is? Oh my goodness. For he is the living God, steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall, shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? Just fascinating. We just saw 70 years of Daniel and his life and his commitment and what he did and the, the power of allowing God to work through him and, and his friends and all these things. In verse 28, what does it say? So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. He served faithfully. Turn with me to James chapter 4, verses 7 and 9. I think we already looked at this, but we need to look at it again. James 4, 7 to 9. Oh, no. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Just submit to God. Resist him. It doesn't say fight him. It doesn't say duke him out. It doesn't say pray stuff over him. or anything. It's just resist him. How do we resist him? Focus on the Lord. Do what he says in prayer, communion with him, and he will flee from us. He's going to flee from us. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hand. Oh, here we go again. He's writing to us Christians. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Me too. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. We just focus on him. Humble ourselves before him. We can see the rest of the chapters. Some other time we'll read Daniel, but the point is those go back in time as far as his reign and where the Lord shared with us through him when our Messiah was coming, what was going to happen in the future, how the day that our Lord Jesus Christ was going to walk on this earth and what he would do for us. And so fascinating book of Daniel and his life. All we have to do, just be faithful. 
Just be faithful. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we just thank you for your word, an opportunity again just to, to dive in and truly hear what it is that you're, you're telling us and how we need to do things. And Father, that we need to just focus on you. We need to be faithful. We need to know you. We need to understand you. The beginning of wisdom is, is knowing who you are. So Father, as you reveal, reveal yourself to us in your scripture, I pray we would continue to read that we would get on a reading schedule, that we would just read constantly, that we would just set things aside and and focus on you. And Lord, that we would be faithful, that we would have a 70-year history to look back on and point, here's where God did this. This is when God did that. Father, that each one of us would just start today even and just focus and be faithful on you. And I just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you guys go ahead and stand, and I want to remind you, if you have kids and they're going to retreat, um, go ahead and stand up um, for the last song. Um, if you've got kids that are going on the retreat, we're going to meet here Friday at 3.30 and go up the hill. But keep the kids in prayer. Keep the kids in prayer that the, the Lord, they would allow the Lord just to do a work in them. Mom, moms and dads will be able to let go of them and, and just let God do a work. So thank you, guys. God bless. Good night, everyone.